then. But I, um, I think part of my interest in, in the whole fisheries and marine biology thing came when I was uh, a young girl and I used to go recreational fishing and boating with my family. And I think that's a lot of where my interest lay. The other thing that happened was I went to a college where each January we had a month of independent study and I was um, fortunate enough to do two of my months of January can you, down can at you the hold, lab and we for the fisheries. And that's, I, while things, started, things started I, from, I, from there, I, I guess. I got a summer I, job and then I after thing. I graduated from college, they asked me if I was and, interested and I'm, and in I didn't realize I was on the librarian of all things. And I said, only if I can be a seagoing librarian. And that I was. And okay. Well, for, uh, while I, I, I'm sorry about this, but the thing went on, you started 15 minutes ago, and I... Pat, just hang on one second. Okay, she did. I just want to remind everybody, if you're not speaking, please do mute yourself so that we can hear the speakers. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. So I became a seagoing librarian, and um, I did make multiple cruises out on our research vessels out of Woods Hole. I also made some cruises on a, a Russian boat in a Polish research vessel back many moons ago. But then I decided it was time to do something else. And that's when I became uh, the first female port agent, not director, but port agent in New Bedford. And I worked uh, for several years down on the docks, going to the fish auction and the scallop auction sampling the catches. And then I, I also had the, uh, the opportunity to go out actually on commercial fishing vessels, not one trip I made on my own vacation time. I went out on one of the high line ground fish vessels and made a trip on, on there with, with everybody. And then I also did a scallop trip with um, one of the uh, good scallop guys in, in New Bedford. That was actually to collect data and sample catches. Um, so I did that for, I don't know, about six, six years or so. And then I was recruited more or less to work on what we then called promoting underutilized species, which are no longer underutilized, such as mackerel and squid. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I just read recently that they've closed the mackerel fishery down because of overfishing. So I guess even though I can't take any credit for the fact that the U.S. industry um, did finally start to um, utilize that species. Um, apparently things have turned around to the, to the other way now. Uh, let's see, after I did that for multiple years, then I had another opportunity and that was to manage what was then the Foreign Fisheries Observer Program. We still had foreign fishing vessels within the 200 mile limits. And even though we had passed the uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act in 1977, but it was a stepped out process to actually remove them from our fisheries. And so I had the foreign observers um, under my wing, so to speak, as much as you can have any observers under your wing. That program, in fact, one of them I think is on this today. And some of you guys from um, UMass Dartmouth probably know him except Steve Cadron. Um, <laughs> then we morphed into doing domestic observing, which is still a very big program today. And it's um, covering pretty much all of the fisheries off the East Coast and not just the East Coast. I, I think it's all the coast now. But um, that has been met with some, well, in some cases, some resistance from the fishing industry. But um, after I left that job, I'm sorry this is so tortured, but then I became the marine mammal and sea turtle stranded coordinator for a short period of time. But we didn't want to leave that just being my only job. Then they, I was asked to actually um, establish and develop a program to monitor where we could see right whales off the East Coast to try to keep the shipping industry away from the right whales. And I spent the last, um, I think about seven or eight years of my career working on the right whale ship strike problem, which was pretty exciting actually, because it was a part of the fisheries that none of us had ever really worked in before. That is the shipping industry, the, the cruise industry, et cetera. And that was primarily 
education and outreach to these people to let them know that we had a, a very highly endangered whale out there um, that we were all trying to protect and save. And, and now if you read the papers, you'll see that um, that whale is still um, in trouble, very much in trouble. And uh, it's not just shipping that we're worried about. It's also um, interacting with fishing gear, primarily fixed gear, such as lobster gear and crab pot gear. So I did make, um, just to sort of sum up and, and not bore you completely, I did make a cruise or a trip, I should say, on a brownfish dragger commercially and a scalloper and two trips on offshore crab vessels, a tuna persona and a tuna by boat. And I had a pretty good introduction to the to the whole fishing industry and not just New Bedford that end of it anyway. So on that note, I'll let Linda speak her part here. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Um, my name is Linda Dupre. I originally came from uh, Brunswick, Maine. And the reason I got interested in my uh, career was uh, my dad had a sports fishing vessel and um, I watched a lot of TV with Sea uh, Hunt and Jacques Cousteau and it was uh, it was rather exciting to see uh, men in bikinis and little red hats uh, running around a ship and doing unusual things underwater. So I thought oh that looks like a good thing for me but there were no women that I ever saw on those vessels. One summer of my sophomore year, I uh, volunteered uh, my time at the Booth Bay Harbor Maine lab where I sorted plankton. And I was uh, allowed to eventually go out on a one day cruise to collect fish and shrimp um, specimens. And that one day cruise parlayed itself into a 40 year career because they never asked me how much experience I had. I just said, I had experience weighing, measuring and sorting fish, which I did, but it was only for a day. Uh, so like I said, I started in 73 and uh, as a biological lab tech, uh, working on um, our own Albatross 4. Um, on bottom trial surveys, shrimp, scallop, and shrimp, shrimp, scallop, and um, clam surveys. And we covered an area between Nova Scotia and Cape Hatteras. We worked 24 hours a day. Uh, at that time, two six hour shifts, which are now on the newer vessel, 12 hour shifts. And we weighed, measured, dissected all the fish, the invertebrates, and shellfish. Um, three years after I started, I, st I uh, became a chief scientist, the first female to do that on a bottom trial survey. And at that point, I was in charge of all the scientific personnel and their work, plus interactions with the captain in case we had bad weather, we had to find a port. I had a seasick scientist or two that need to be medically evacuated. And, um, or we had ship breakdowns. So we had to negotiate where we would go and how long we'd be in. Uh, when I was ashore, I was a uh, supervisory fishery biologist in charge of all the data processing. All the data that we'd collect on, on our cruises uh, would have to pass through our office. I also, like um, Pat, got to work on Soviet ships. Uh, I also went on Russia, um, Polish, East and West German, and uh, uh, Moroccan research vessels. Uh, I also got to go down in a 15 foot sub submarine a couple of times in the Gulf of Maine looking for shrimp. Um, at the end of my career, I had over 1600 days out at sea during the 40 years. So I, salt is a great preservative. <laughs> so that's my story in a nutshell. Thank you. It's, it, fascinating so far, I think. Thank <laughs> you so much, the two of you. Um, so I think we're, we said we would sort of go in alphabetical order. So we're going to start with Aubrey. Did you want me to put your slide up or not no. yet? 
sure if you want to that's that's fine okay. um, I, I hi everyone <laughs> hard to follow after all those <laughs> experiences. But um, again, my name is Aubrey Church. I got into fisheries from really just exploring tidal pools in Maine. Um, I did Acadia Institute of Oceanography in Seal Harbor as a marine biology camp in summer. I did a sea semester out on a tall ship. Um, in college, I studied abroad in the Turks and Caicos with the School for Field Studies, and that gave me firsthand experience working with artisanal spear fishermen that were prim primarily targeting Nassau grouper. So that was my first experience doing research on fin fish dock landings and trying to assess regulations and kind of some fisheries management for Nassau grouper down in Turks and Caicos. After college, I was a at sea monitor and NOAA Northeast Fisheries Observer. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that program, there's about 120 observers nationwide. Uh, we work on commercial fishing vessels from Maine to New Jersey in the Northeast, or some down in North Carolina, excuse me. But uh, you know, you're you're essentially a scientist on board trying to get a snapshot of what's out at sea, what fishermen are catching, why are they keeping it, why are they discarding it, looking out for protected species. And so that was a great experience for me um, and really gave me firsthand knowledge. <laughs> For a while, I was the life of the observer program. So I joked by putting that picture up. Uh, since I've probably been replaced, that was probably over 10 years ago now. Um, but I did a lot of outreach for the observer program. That was really my firsthand experience working alongside the commercial fishing industry and really understanding the day-to-day -day challenges that they face. Since then, I am a research biologist at the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation. That's a nonprofit based in Rhode Island. And so we work directly with the commercial fishing industry and we're directed by fishermen and those in the support businesses. So I run a lobster and Jonah crab research fleet. We have boats from Maine um, to about Long Island, New York, and the fishermen themselves go out and collect data at sea and I work with them collaboratively. I also work with Jim Manning at the Science Center. That's a picture of me holding a telemetry temperature logger. Um, I also do shelf oceanographic research fleet in partnership with Huey. So again, we have fishermen use CTDs, which is what that instrument is on the top right corner, and they deploy it over the side of their vessel and we'll collect oceanographic information to try to understand changing ocean conditions and what that means for key fisheries. And most recently, I'm running an offshore wind fisheries monitoring survey. So we're doing a baseline study before the wind tur turbines are being put into the ground and that's for the gillnet fishery. So I'm working with gillnetters. And I'm also in a second year um, of my master's program at SMAST at the UMass Dartmouth School of Marine Science and Technology. And you don't sleep very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I yeah I really enjoy being out on the water. I don't I think I probably have 350 sea days, so no, nowhere near close. But I'll, that'll be my target. <laughs> so I'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you very much. So I think the next person to speak is going to be Allison. And Allison, would you like me to try to pull your slide up at this point? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's see if I can. Oops. All right, hi everyone. My name is Allison Fry, and like many of the other speakers here, I got my uh, initial interest in the ocean and fishing from uh, fishing with my dad and my family. He's an avid striper fisherman. Um, from there, I realized I was very interested in marine biology and science in high school. So I decided to pursue marine biology at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I had several different internships and um, small scale research projects before Jeremy Colley brought me into his lab to work on um, some fisheries research. I was looking at ichthyoplankton in Narragansett Bay. Um, my time at URI was definitely very formative. I went um, on a study abroad experience uh, to the Philippines for a January term where I was looking at um, communities that are sustenance fishing and uh, really developed an interest in the um, kind of applicability of fishery science and the real world impacts. Um, from then I was hired as a biological technician at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center at the Narragansett Lab. Um, I was still looking at larval fish, looking at uh, window pane founder otoliths. I did three legs on the bottom trawl survey over my time there, um, which gave me some awesome firsthand at sea uh, experience with biological sampling. And then my advisor, Steve Cadron, brought me on um, to SMAST at UMass Dartmouth 
to work on a uh, study looking at Atlantic cod in the offshore wind energy lease areas. We're tagging fish. Um, it's pretty field intensive work. And um, yeah, it's gonna be a good assessment of the pre-construction habitat use that, that's going on there. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, we have um, Trisha Perez and I will try to pull her slide up next. Cool. Yeah, so I'm Trisha Perez and I'm another student at um, SMAST and I didn't really grow up fishing or really going to the beach that much. We just went to Cocoa Beach every year and that was enough to interest me to do marine science in uh, undergrad. And I did that at USC, South Carolina. And uh, I think I only saw the ocean like four times in undergrad. So after undergrad, I wanted to be a fisheries observer, which was a really aggressive way to get into seeing the ocean and being on the ocean. And I was an observer for three years um, with some gaps in between. Um, I was observing groundfish vessels, scallop, fluke, and sea bass, and small mesh like squid. and um, tried to get in as many ports as I could. I didn't make it all the way to North Carolina, but I made it to Jersey. Um, and so I just learned a lot about the fisheries that we have um, on the East Coast. And along the way, I took breaks in that three years and I um, worked on an oyster farm for a little bit. I tried to start a kelp farm for a minute. Um, I delivered lobsters to Boston at 2 a.m. And I spent a season um, as a sternman on a lobster boat out of uh, Green Harbor in Massachusetts. Um, and so then today, I am finishing up my master's at SMAST, and we're doing a cooperative research survey um, on a scallop vessel uh, down on, out on George's Bank, um, where we actually put a video camera in the net, which is really cool to just collect a lot more data and not have to, and just allow the fish to return back to the sea. So that's been really um, cool being with fishermen and also using some really cool technology. Um, and then I also work part-time for Integrated Monitoring, um, which is a company that's providing um, VM, broadband VMS and internet to fishermen, um, along with other vessel services, which has felt really good to kind of give back to um, a community of fishermen that kind of took care of me for three years. And so it's nice to at least give them some internet to text their wife that they'll be out for two more days. So <laughs> that feels good. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, let me get us all back here. Um, so many directions we could go. Um, so maybe just, I don't know if Linda or Pat have sort of just hearing these younger women talk about the experiences that they've had in the time that they've been involved, what kinds of changes does that bring up for you? Do you see that there have been changes since you were first involved or in the years that you were involved? Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've come a long ways. Uh, back in uh, 1948, um, Rachel Carson was the first federal employee female to go out on one of our research vessels. She was supposed to go out in 48 with a, another woman, but the other woman had to cancel. And the chief scientist wrote in his cruise report, there was great relief expressed by all other scientists on that cruise that women, the presence of women on the vessel would have been resented. So that, that caught my attention. And then in uh, 73, I had a little discussion um, with the Mass Maritime uh, Admiral uh, Harrington when he said that he was of the opinion, the personal belief that women are not strong enough to take the profession of the sea. I can't see women standing watch for four hours in a bad storm. I wrote back to him, and said that women wouldn't always feel as if they had to prove themselves in their work if men would base their opinions on a person's ability and not on their sex. Three years later, six women were finally admitted to the Mass Maritime Academy. Uh, not because of me, but because eventually time had changed 
and Title IX, which was federally uh, funded, allowed um, there could be no discrimination based on sex um, that were uh, in the educational arena. So times have changed, at least for, for me and Pat. I, I have a question for the, um, the three younger ladies. I think you all said you were fishery observers. Is that correct? Two of us were. Two, two were. When, when you got on board those boats or tried to make arrangements to get on board those boats, how, how were you greeted or how were you welcomed? You know, I, I love that question. I get, I get asked it a lot for job interviews, which is kind of funny too. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it was a mixed bag, right? For some men, female was bad luck. So that really freaked them out. Uh, another time I'd call and they'd say, no, we don't take women, hang up. And you go, uh, okay, hold on, let me talk to my coordinator, see if I can get a guy. And then there wouldn't be one available. And I'd have to call back and say, well, it's me. And I'd show up to the dock and all the women were there lined up, all the wives. And it was pretty intimidating. And I had my little braids that I always wore. And they go, are, are you Norwegian? And I said, yeah. And then they all hugged me. And I was like, they were all Norwegian. And then we were all best friends. And it was the funny joke, you know, that it was a scenario where I could have. So I always make the runny joke to my parents. You know, am I Italian today? Am I Norwegian? You know, what works for, for the family members to be respectful? But in all seriousness, you know, I think many fishermen saw me and my other fellow women as daughters. They were really respectful. They, um, you know, I, I always say that fishermen are some of the hardest working people that I've ever met. And if you go on their boat and you're respectful and you work just as hard, I always felt I had to prove myself and work harder than anyone else. I used to always hate when they'd say, oh, the last observer slept or puked. And I was like, bring it on. You know, I'm, I'm going to show you that I work hard. And, and I think by the end of it, we got along really well. But I do, you know, there were a few times that they cursed at me or said, how could your father be proud of you? You know, you're, you're destroying fishermen's lives for a living. Um, you know, you got a few of those that were definitely challenging, but I feel like that's what got me so passionate about working with the industry is that I wanted to bridge that gap. And that was kind of a question I had for the two of you is, you know, back then there might've been more animosity towards fishermen and scientists. And to me, you know, I work strictly with fishermen and I love it. And I, and it's such a, the movement of working collaboratively with fishermen is really, you know, pioneering and not, or just like the momentum is moving forward. And I think that that's the way the future of fishery science is. And so I just kind of wanted to talk about that as well. But go ahead, Trish, too, if you have your thoughts on that comment about. No, yeah, I think you hit it. I, I think you hit it on the head. Um, there's definitely some moments in those three years where you did feel unwelcome. But I think um, one tactic was like staying in a port for a little while, too. So then you have proven yourself and you have worked hard and you haven't just slept it, it through every day. <laughs> And, and so fishermen talk. And so then you're able to get on more trips and they might even request you and you might request them and you can create some really um, lasting relationships. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. When I made that trip on the, the ground fish boat, again, it was my vacation time because I wanted to see what it was like to be out there and work as hard as they worked. And what I found out was, is that none of the wives knew that I was gonna be on that boat until after I was out there for a few days and word spread through the fleet. And when I came in, I ran into the captain and his wife the night I came in at a, a restaurant in Mattapoisett. And I noticed that she was a bit cold towards me. <laughs> like, um, like I was a bad person chasing after her husband or whatever. But I always said to these guys, if I really want to rendezvous with any of you guys, I'm not going to go out to sea to rendezvous. <laughs> what a stupid place to do it. Um, the other thing I found was, and I, I don't know if Linda can had these same experiences, you did have to work pretty much more than 100%. You really had to prove yourself. I also found that every time I'd walk over towards the railing, there would be someone behind me saying, you're sick, I know you're sick. And I always disappointed them. I'm sorry, I am not sick. <laughs> so seasickness is another one of the things they look for, of course. But um, after you've uh, gotten in there, I guess good graces or shown that you can do what you need to do out there, they really are great people to, to work with. 
Yeah, I feel like, you know, when you spend, you know, some of these trips could be 12 hours or they could be 12 days long or 14 days long. You know, when you're working with them 24-7, you, you really form a special bond, whether you like it or not. You know, um, you really get to learn a lot about them. And as Trish was saying, you know, for me, I love the day trips because I got to meet a new fisherman every day, you know, and and it was exhausting waking up different ports, going to Gloucester, then going on Jersey, then going back up to Maine. But to me, meeting more people and getting to learn more about each fishery. And I think that was the other thing is, you know, this is their home. This is what they, they're they proud of and, and the knowledge they have. So I think for me, I would just ask about the gear and, and how long they've been fishing. I learned a lot about fisheries management. I, you know, they have a lot of really important knowledge and, you know, I know we'll talk about it later, but, you know, what we want to say for younger fish, you know, women in fishery science. But to me, you really got to immerse yourself in at sea and work with fishermen. You'll learn a lot more than a textbook would ever teach you. Yeah, I had similar experience as Pat in that that one day cruise that I made out of Booth Bay. It was supposed to be a two day trip. We were going to leave nine o'clock at night and be on station first thing the following day. But we found out that, you know, the wives, what would the wives say about a, another woman going out on the boat? And so thankfully, there was somebody who was supportive. And we sailed at one minute past midnight. So the cruise report only showed a one day trip, not a two day trip. I was going to the same cabin that I would have gone three hours earlier, slept until we got on station the next day. I mean, that, that same day. So yeah, it was, uh, there, was a, there was pressure from fishermen as well as from the, the wives. I mean, it was something new. And also, um, you're right. There were fishermen that would either ignore us, try to molest us, or um, adopt us as another daughter. So we became, for most part, part of the family for those that wanted us as another daughter. Uh, but I do have to take tip my hat off to the whaling wives out of New Bedford and Nantucket, who they were the first pioneers really to get out on those boats with their husbands under the less than ideal conditions um, and the diaries that they kept. I mean, they were the first scientists who really recorded where they were when they got the whales. So my, my, my hat is, is off to them too. And for years, they would be gone, right? Yes. But, um, this is it's fascinating and i just i think that it's interesting there's sort of a double whammy right because it's not just that you're women on their boat you're also observers so there's a the resistance to being um surveilled or um observed <laughs> um, a lot of fishermen i think get into fishing in part because they really want the independence and they want to be um you know out there and and not uh this is kind of contrary to that so there's that and then there's the whole gender piece as well um, and the yeah. superstitions and, and whatnot go ahead trisha i was just going to say yeah definitely like we represent the government and um so that was tough especially in the beginning when you're first an observer because you just tried to learn everything in your training for about a month and then you get on the boat and you're just trying to species id and then they're t telling you about the regulations and management and you're like it's a lot at first and and so that kind of goes into aubrey's advice and my own in just listening and being open is like so important and really the only way to succeed and have fun while you're observing. So that's a good segue. I'd be curious to hear from each of you something about what it is that you really enjoy about this work. And there may be more than one thing, but maybe just a couple of highlights or, or things that really just uh, fulfill you up, you know, that you, that you just find really fabulous. Yeah, I can start. So one is just being on the ocean and just being part of it and close to it and feeling its power and everything and, and the solitude you can get from going out to sea um, is really amazing. And then secondly, kind of on the same thing we've been talking about, like learning so much from fishermen. Um, I really enjoy that. And, and then thirdly, as a result, you're just part of the community. Like now, you know, these people, you know, the guys on the shore side you know the scientists like you can really you know consumers you know you can really just be a part of this really special community in new england is at least what i can speak to um 
and I love it, Ann. I think for me, it was when Pat and I were going to see, there was no email, there was no cell phone, there was no satellite phone. When you went out on the boat, you were isolated, you were out there and you got to know the people regardless of their title or their status in life. The ocean is a great equalizer. And, you know, it made no difference if you were a PhD, you were still puking over the side. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, you got to get up and go back to work. But you got to know people intimately because you depended on each of, the, each of us in order to survive being out there. So it's different than working in an office where you pass each other and you say, good morning. Here you get to know people as they really, really are. And I think that was, you know, being on as many foreign vessels as I got to be on, I made a lot of lasting friendships because of language difficulties or the food difficulties as Pat and I will attest to. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we either uh, didn't go, you know, we went without meals or we ate more or drank more. <laughs> but it was, it was a good time because we didn't have so many distractions. There was no TV. But now with the newer vessels, that technology has taken over. So it is a bit different now. Well, yeah, one I thing would... I learned is I, I spent a lot of time down on the docks when I'd be sampling the catches, going to the auction. And then when I made trips on the commercial boats, I realized that one of the things that we as scientists do um, that really can sort of break down communications is to talk the talk that we tend to do, the acronyms and, and some of the common scientific terms that we throw around without thinking about it twice. I think if we talk to these people in a language that they can understand, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and, and we weren't good as scientists at doing that, but as I worked at the docks, I realized that there were some keywords in, um, in their vocabulary that um, some of which I've come away with in my own uh, vernacular now that aren't so good, but <laughs> um, you, you really need to, to talk to them so that they can understand what it is you're trying to say rather than throw around some of the terms that we tend to use. And I too really enjoyed working with um, all these people that I worked with, the guys on the docks, the people out on the commercial fishing vessels. They were a big part of, of what I enjoyed out there. The other thing was when, you, when you're out at sea like this, you never know what's gonna come up in the net. And that makes it interesting. Um, on the scallop trip that I was on, I just happened to come out on deck, I was off watch. And when I came out on deck, all of a sudden the, the uh, drag came up and it appeared as though, and they responded as though we had a torpedo in the scallop drag um, and they dumped it. And I was like, oh my, what's going to happen next? So whether it was or it wasn't a, a torpedo or not, I, I'll never know. But that was kind of one of the scary encounters. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a different, uh, it's a different way of life, I guess we could say. I, I asked one of the guys when they were out there, actually hip deep in codfish, which is not the norm now, of course. I said, what is it you're thinking when you're out here doing this work, the same thing over and over again? And this one guy said to me, he goes, as I toss each cod, I go, there's a Heineken, there's two Heineken, <laughs> and there's three Heinekens. I said, okay. <laughs> So I think Allison was also had something to say here. Yeah, I would echo um, all of those points between just the sheer beauty of the ocean and then the teamwork and and team um, like interpersonal aspects. But also, I find um, working at sea to be personally really um, great. Uh, like I go out there, I have one job to do often, no cell service. Uh, sometimes I'm tasked between choosing, making hard choices, um, and it, it can be a really great confidence booster and um, really powerful just to be out there, get the job done, come back in, and feel, feel accomplished. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I think I echo everyone else's, you know, the only, I love being at sea, you really get to see things that very few people ever really get to see, you know, there'll be sunset over the water of George's bank where you're 200 miles out to sea, humpback whales breaching meters from your boat, um, even snow falling on the open ocean, gorgeous. You know, and like Pat was saying, the chance to get to see all these amazing sea life and you really don't know what gets pulled up out of the net. I think that's really exciting for me. And I think that being at sea, you, it really teaches you things about yourself and it really pushes you past your comfort zone and boundaries. You know, I think people always want to hear your stories, but I also think it taught me to be an effective communicator and a good listener and not just blab away because, you know, when I get on a boat, I've already had two cups of coffee, the fishermen are tired and I'm like ready to have a whole <laughs> lecture and they're not ready for it. So, you know, learning a little bit about, um, you know, when to, when to speak is a good thing too for me. But, you know, my favorite part, and I've said this probably at, at any interview that anyone asked me is just getting to work alongside the fishing community and building that trust and, and bridge between the scientific and management and the fishing industry when everyone works collaboratively no one questions the validity of that data. If it's collected both by fishermen and scientists, both people agree, they trust that data being used and they feel confident that they can hang their hat on that data. And so I, that's my favorite part is just really bridging that gap and making sure that every person's voice is heard, not just fishermen, not just scientists, you know, collaboratively together and we build that trust and community. I think um, I've, I've been very impressed over the last couple of decades with the um, people that I've met who are connected with the School for Marine Science and Technology and that model that they seem to be so committed to. Um, and it really does seem to, to yield the best results and the most trusted results on both sides, which is great. So what I wanna do is um, give people a chance who are listening uh, to, to ask questions. And so we don't have too much melee here. Um, if you would like to ask a question, there's a raise the hand function, I believe. So we can look for you and call you out by name. Or if you wanna type something into the chat, I can relate the question to the rest of the group. Um, and maybe while we're waiting for some questions, I did get one request from somebody in the audience who wanted to hear from Madeline, who's not technically on the panel, but Madeline is um, a close friend and board member of the Fishing Heritage Center and um, recently retired from MIT Sea Grant. So a fisheries, a social scientist, but um, has spent a good amount of time on the boats. He just wanted to know a little bit about your experiences, Madeline, if you want to share. Well, sure. Thanks for asking. Um, I, I, and it was Jim Kendall, just incidentally. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, actually, I, my first fishing experience was as a grad student. Um, I had to do field work in the Boston area and I didn't really want to spend the summer in Boston. I'm, I'm from the West Coast. So I kind of looked around, where's the farthest from Boston I can be and still be considered in the Boston area. And so I went to Provincetown and I used to go out at four o'clock in the morning and hail a captain going out and I'd say, would you mind if I go out with you for the day? And they always said, yes, it was astounding. Um, they were just day boats. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, accommodations or anything like that. Um, but it was small boats, large boats and everything in between. Uh, and the technology varied accordingly. And uh, sometimes I would not drink coffee because it was problematic. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I, I, that's where I learned the vocabulary. The, somebody was saying, maybe Pat, you were saying that there are certain terms that you kind of, once you learn that terminology, you can talk to the fishermen and you don't sound like a total idiot. And they feel like you're, you're paying attention. You're trying to learn something about their lives and their, uh, their experience. I had the same problem with wives. Um, I spent the summer in Provincetown going out on the boats and knew very few wives. They, the, the, at that time, the men had um, radios and the wives had, had the receiving stations in their kitchens. So they would hear what's going on. And the men would be teasing each other over the channel 16 saying, oh, I have this co-ed with in her bikini out on the <laughs> on the deck, and of course I was covered in gurry. I was in in you know full full gear, 
was not never in a bikini, <laughs> but that was the story that was related. So, so it took a while to 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 break the barrier with the families, but um, and I wasn't there long enough to really do a good job of that, but a little bit. Um, and it was it gave me the understanding, the basic understanding of fisheries management and of the impacts of the of management on the communities and on fishing families. And that's really the way I spent my career was looking at how people were affected by changes in management and trying to help the, the management system pay attention and, and take into consideration if there were, they needed to make rules that cut back on overfishing. Everybody agreed to that, but there were ways to do it that wouldn't also decimate the industry totally and wouldn't ruin the communities. And that was the, my argument the whole time. I feel like now that I'm retired, there are enough social scientists around, there is enough work that's been done over the last several decades that the managers are listening and they are hearing now and they are paying more attention. Um, I sometimes felt like I was, uh, you know, speaking in the <laughs> in the wilderness and not really being very heard. So it's been really, it's been really fun for me to work with the, with the center, the, the Fishing Heritage Center, because I feel like this is the second opportunity that I've had in my life to try to talk more about what it means to be a fisherman, what it means to be in a fishing community, and, and how you can create that balance between the science and the sustainability and still have a living and still have food to, you know, to enjoy. So if anybody wants to ask other questions, that's fine. There is actually one. Um, so we have a live audience watching this in the Fishing Heritage Center right now. <laughs> and there's a question from an audience member who would like to know how the scientists collect samples, what they do to measure and weigh them. Um, and do they take measurements on board or do they bring samples back to the lab? I don't know if one of you wants to start with um, or explain that a bit, Tricia, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, so for fisheries observing, um, everything is done on board and it kind of depends on what came up in the net. So if there's not a lot of discards and you can get your hands on every single fish, then we will measure and weigh every single fish, you know, all together, like all the cod are here, all the haddock are here, all the, you know. And then um, for some species, we take samples, um, like they're called otoliths, they're ear bones that have rings like a tree. And so it helps us age the fish and understand how old the fish are that we're catching or discarding. Um, yeah, and everything's done at sea. But I think on the bottom trawl surveys, it might be a little, little different. And um, oh. Ali went on a bunch of those and obviously Linda. Yeah, it's just the same thing. Our, our nets were towed back on the Albatross floor for 20 minutes and we, uh, I mean 30 minutes, and we would uh, bring whatever the net caught up and uh, sort everything, weigh and measure everything. And uh, if there were too many, we'd take a subsample, a smaller portion of the large catch, pull out the otoliths, the little ear bones that give the fish some equilibrium. And then we did analyze their stomach contents. We looked to see what they've been eating. Um, we would take scale samples if that was requested. Uh, sometimes blood samples for some later workup. Uh, we would also take plankton samples. We tow a net and pick up the plankton. We do oceanographic information, water temperature, um, depth, um, conductivity. So there was. A variety every every it de sometimes depended on the area that we were working in as to what we had to do but like i said we were constantly busy and uh, we covered a large area like i said from nova scotia down to cape Hatteras. i think a lot of that i'll echo the only thing i would add is um you know if we were encountering any protected species that that was something both as an observer you know it's really important that you know you might be able to bring the animal back uh, if unfortunately there was any interaction with the gear, you know, we could bring those animal backs to do necropsies and really understand the cause of death. Um, so I do think that that's something else that we did, whether it was seals, uh, seabirds, turtles, um, 
any other protected species are endangered and threatened. So that's something else. And then with the gillnet survey that I'm currently working on, we also do fish stomachs. So we, we excise those out at, out at sea and then we bring the fish stomachs back into the lab to see what the monkfish and winter skate are eating specifically for that study. One of the things um, you typically have to do, I think is depending on how quickly everything's happening on the boat, you, you sometimes have to subsample what comes on board. If that's what you're asking, Jim, I'm not exactly sure, but they, they can't always sample everything that comes up on deck um, on the commercial boats. They try, sometimes they do have to subsample. And, and we kept, um, as a former manager of that program, we kept imposing more and more sampling requirements on the observers as things went on. So if they, they had plenty to keep them busy if they were doing their job correctly. <laughs> Yeah, and I just would like to tout the research that I'm doing right now at SMAS, where I kind of mentioned it before, where we put a video camera into the net and leave the back of the net open. So now we are counting the fish without bringing them on board, um, which is really cool because we're able to sample way more and get um, a, a much better estimate of how many fish are um, in the area that we sampled. So that's kind of cool, still being able to count the fish maybe even measure the fish with the stereoscopic cameras that we use um, without any type of um, mortality or the fish dying on deck. We actually have a small uh, clip of that video that somebody from SMAS uh, was good enough to give us for our exhibit. So if you wanna come in and watch, and people stand there and they're just mesmerized watching the fish swim in. And then we explain, I mean, it just, it's explained in the video that uh, no fish were injured in this experiment. And, <laughs> um, and I believe it's also, there's effort to teach computers how to size and, and um, identify species, correct? Yeah, so right now we're trying to work on an algorithm. Right now, I think it's able to say that's a round fish and that's a flat fish, but I don't think it's ready to be like, that's a yellowtail flounder or that's a cod. So, but it's really kind of cool to be, have this AI, uh, kind of developing. Allie, I meant to say, sampling, but yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you to say about tagging. <laughs> yeah, my sampling um, looks completely different. I'm also taking some biological samples like what was described, length, um, otoliths. We're looking at the sexual maturity stage of codfish, but then I also have this whole tagging component. So we're um, rod and reel fishing for uh, live spawn, um, cod in spawning condition, we bring them up to the boat and insert a transmitting tag. So the tag is sending out a unique ping. And then we have receiver stations set up around our study area that are listening for those fish. So we can get um, pretty fine scale data for um, when and where these cod are in the ocean. And it um, really kind of mimics their natural behavior. So it's, it's a whole different kind of sampling, but um, still useful. So let's see, I, a couple of things that I'm interested in. Um, I'm curious if COVID impacted your ability to do science over the last 18 months, for the, those of you who are actively in the, out on the water. Yeah, my project um, was definitely impacted. Uh, it's a three-year study. We're in our third year this winter, um, but year two, we took a hard hit. There was, it was like a six month gap where we weren't um, out at, on the water. We lost a lot of gear and our uh, tagging rates were lower than expected, but um, we've adjusted our expectations and are trying to manage as best as we can. Um, with getting more tags out year round. And we've extended the study a little bit as well. Yeah, my study goes out to George's bank um, every fall and spring. And so I think we missed out on that spring one. Yeah, like, cause we usually go in April. So like April, 2020 was lost. Um, but we also do that same video survey up in the Gulf of Maine uh, to look for cod rather than flounders, what I look at. And um, because we've been working with the same um, crew of fishermen since 2013, they know how to run the survey and they actually ran an entire survey um, themselves. And so that was really um, cool and rewarding. And um, I'm sure that they got a kick out of it too. <laughs> 
And because I work directly hand in hand with the fishing industry, you know, for a lot of the research projects that I run, the fishermen are the ones that are collecting data at sea. So I think it really highlighted the importance of utilizing fishermen's time on the water. They had, you know, weren't impacted. They were grateful. We do provide stipends for them if they collect data at sea. So to them, that was additional money that they could rely on during COVID times. Um, but you know, I think they were really proud because they knew a lot of the science center surveys weren't happening um, and there was huge data gaps. And these are huge time series that managers are using um, to base their sound science. And so I think for the industry, it was their chance to really shine and continue to collect data and be proud of it. And so, um, you know, in my case, they were they were continuing on. They were like, you know, the ocean still got to get saved. So we'll do it. <laughs> so, you know, they were they had good attitudes, but it was great. So. Okay, we have another question, this one from Madeline. Um, are any fishermen involved in collaborative research on issues related to wind farm developments? Yes, <laughs> um, definitely. And I think that the fishing community wants to be involved um, to them, something that they always like being involved, particularly in the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation that I'm a part of, is that they have ownership of the data that they collect. You know, when they work with other state or federal agencies, that data gets sent off and unless they request it, they don't get access. And so the fishermen, particularly that I work with, with these wind surveys are getting ownership and access of that data. And so that's really important to them, particularly with these wind turbines. So um, with our foundation, we have a beam trawl survey. We have a ventless trap that looks at lobsters and Jonah crabs. I run our gill net survey that's focused on monkfish and winter skate. And we also have a fish pot survey. They're all for offshore wind development. So we're trying to get a baseline and to assess the distribution and abundance of fish in these areas prior to development. So we're doing two years of baseline, then ideally two years during construction and then two years after post-construction. And so yes, many fishermen wanna be involved. They're at meetings um, wanting to voice their concerns and input, but I also think they wanna be a part of the data collection process so that they believe in that data moving forward, whether it's for compensation down the road for them getting displaced with hundreds of turbines um, or if it's just trusting in the data that's out there. Yeah, my survey uh, that I work on is on George's Bank, but within my lab, we have a lot of cooperative uh, research surveys with the wind farm area. We also do a ventless trap survey for lobsters and crabs. We do um, a plankton survey to try to, I think, the still look for lobster larvae, but it's collecting any type of larvae or plankton that's in the water in that area. Um, we also do a drop camera survey where we send a pyramid with cameras down to take photos of the seafloor to kind of look at um, if there's scallops or what else is on the ground and just the substrate. Is this sand? Is this gravel? Um, yeah, I think those are the three we're doing. Yeah, my um, tagging work also um, we work collaboratively with commercial and recreational charter fishermen and echoing Aubrey's point, um, both groups seem to really take a lot of pride in their involvement with the offshore wind um, surveys. I think for them, they know it's coming, they will most likely be impacted. So it's, um, it's logical for them to take part and try to understand and prepare for these impacts as best as they can. We have a question, another question for you specifically, Allison, um, about where you worked in the Philippines. Oh, I was um, in Dagupan on um, kind of the main island. Uh, we were in, um, oh, I see the question. Um, yeah, we were in Bataan. It was the San... I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but um, it was a region um, kind of, yeah, on the northwestern side of the largest island. And we were in a small city looking at uh, closely how the local community was using aquaculture and fisheries. How about some uh, thoughts for young women who may um, I don't know if there are young women watching tonight, but maybe they'll watch the recording, but just in general, your thoughts about women who want to get into the field, girls who want to get into the field and maybe things you wished you'd known or just advice from your perspective where you sit now. I would suggest uh, volunteering. I mean, my one day experience, like I said, you made connections. Sometimes it's not what you know, but who you know. And so that was able I was able to parlay those acquaintances into 
job opportunity. And that's uh, a job that I love. Um, I would, you know, see Education Association. That's another one that's very good. Uh, consider something in the Aquavet program. They, they, that is a, a growing industry uh, where they're looking for uh, veterinarians in the marine field to take care of their large investments of marine mammals. Um, so, you know, get your door, get your foot into the door. And then my only other suggestion is to learn another language. Being French Canadian, that helped me um, to, to work in Morocco. Um, being on Soviet and Polish ships, those two languages are very similar. Um, and so I was able to talk with many of the, the, the crew members on the ship. Um, so it's, it's uh, it would open up more opportunities if you have another language ability. I think I agree that uh, trying to look for volunteer activities, but if not, it seems as though many of the colleges now promote internships and look for some sort of an internship that's gonna get you into the field or close to being into the field. And if this is something you wanna do, then hang in there because there's going to be a lot of naysayers. Um, but you can tell by these three ladies that are here from UMass Dartmouth that uh, you can do it. I have every faith. <laughs> yeah, I think my best tip um, after volunteering would be to um, join organizations. In my undergrad, I was part of the Society for Women in Marine Science, and they matched undergrads with graduate student mentors. And uh, my mentor was great. She showed me how to make a CV, cover letter, applied to jobs. And from that first job I got, I can like follow the chain of, of the network, people knowing people, knowing people. And it just um, kept turning into more and more jobs or opportunities. Um, so definitely make sure to uh, get yourself involved, talk to people, um, not only um, people superior to you, but also your peers. Um, Trish, Aubrey, and I are all in classes together. And uh, it's a great, great network that we have as students at SMAST. Yeah, I, I echo all of that. You know, I, I think I was really fortunate growing up to have, you know, the abilities that my parents gave me for internships or for different summer programs that not other, some people may not be able to. So I definitely think, you know, I have to be appreciative of those of those opportunities. But I do think for for women, you know, they really try to put yourself out there. Um, I think that that's really important to kind of go head first into challenges. Talk being with a lot of fishermen. You know, at the time when I did the observing job, I loved it, and I didn't really know how it would help me career wise. But talking to many of the fishermen I work with now, they're like, "Oh, you were an observer," and they have a whole level of respect for me. They're like, "Oh, you've been on the water, so you understand that." And they just, you know, then then that's it, and they just move on, and they respect the fact that you have been out in the field, that you're willing to go out to sea, and kind of get your hands dirty, um, and really work hard. But I think also just taking, I think something that I've been really pushing more in the future is better science communication. You know, you can have great science, but if you can't communicate it effectively to people, whether it's scientists or fishermen, then you haven't really done your job. And, and so to me, I, I think for any future scientist, you really gotta learn how to pub, you know, do public speaking and to communicate science effectively. And so that's something I'm always pushing people to do moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, if, there's any undergrads listening, or if anyone has a daughter, or granddaughter, or anything, um, research experience for undergrads, REUs, I was able to get two of those. And I definitely think, you know, being a woman helped me get those. And those were incredible and opened my eyes to research what it's like to be a grad student. And that was my first um, experience in fisheries, even learning what a fishery was, was at one of those. So I would definitely um, suggest that. And I would definitely promote, if you want fisheries, I think being an observer, there's no other way, um, or that's not true, not no other way, but I'm really <laughs> thankful for my experience because I just learned so much um, in a really aggressive but fun way. Um, 
And then, yeah, definitely Aubrey hit it on the head, science communication. And I think a big part of that is being confident and loving what you do and being able to speak about it and connect. Um, yeah. And oh. I'll, I'll just say that, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I, I was just gonna say, I had a question for Pat and Linda. Um, so we're all like early career scientists. And so I was kind of wondering if you had advice for us three as um, you know, more established, being more established in your career. Um, yeah. I, I think you guys sound like you're really on the right track here. I really do. I think you've, you've already had a lot of experiences and um, I, I don't know if you want to stick with, with what you're doing, but I think you're uh, well on your way to getting a, a good career under your belt. And if you, if you like Steve, at some point, you're going to decide, yep, now I want to go for my PhD too. Yeah, I think the main advantage that you all have over both Pat and I is the technology. Um, that definitely uh, was above above and beyond my interest <laughs> and capabilities. I was the old fashioned blood and guts biologist and uh, hand recorded on paper. So uh, for you to get instant um, feedback and to be able to analyze your data quicker, uh, more accurately, you know, that, that is heads and tails above what we were exposed to and capable of back in the early days. So keep it yeah, up. My, my master's thesis was typed on a typewriter. <laughs> do, do you guys know what typewriters are? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, Laura, I'm not sure, but I thought Jim had his hand up at some point. Oh, I'm sorry. Jim, make sure I'm thank you. Go for it. Just to unmute Jim. Jim, you need to unmute. Just too many ways to unmute. I tried using the quick key. Oh. Jim, you're muted again. All right. <laughs> I said I just I just wanted to apologize for blindsiding Madeline by getting her in on the, the conversation, but I don't know how many people realize, uh, well, she blindsided a lot of us at, at many times on the dock asking us questions. So I think turnabout's fair play, but Madeline played an important role in getting a lot of fishermen comfortable with giving her information that they wouldn't provide anyone else. I mean, that was, that was secret toes and secret business. And today there are no secrets, uh, so, you know, in the same fashion, but, but like I say, she played a big role in moving that along. And as I see other people here as well, uh, who have contributed a lot to getting fishermen more comfortable with working. So I just wanted to thank them all. And You're I welcome. was just gonna say that in my experience um, over the years with the students from SMAS, the passion just shines through and that you all have, I mean, everyone that I've run into and there've been quite a few, the you're just very natural communicators and for me i am very much i, I said when we first got together i'm decidedly not a scientist <laughs> um and so to to feel like i can have an understanding of what you're doing um is really important i think and that's just in, so i would definitely echo what aubrey said and, and trisha said too so great well this has been fascinating i don't know if there are last questions from the audience but we're just a little over an hour so i don't want to keep people too too long Any hands or in the chat or anything? Well, seeing and hearing none, um, I would just remind you to please stop by the Fishing Heritage Center if you're in the New Bedford area. Come see our women's work exhibit. We're open uh, Thursday through Sunday from 10 until four. We also just launched that exhibit on our website. So you can find it at fishingheritagecenter.org under exhibits and digital exhibits on women's work. Um, and we have a number of programs coming up. So check our Facebook page and Instagram and calendar and, and so on and so forth. I wanna give a huge thank you to our panelists, um, Pat Jerrier, Linda Dupree, 
Aubrey Church, Trisha Perez, and Allison Fry. So thank you all so much for um, sharing. Uh, it's been fascinating and inspiring. And, um, and thanks to everybody who attended tonight. See you soon, I hope. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. So if it's recorded, uh, we'll be able to find it on the. Yeah, I'll have to figure out how to send okay. it to you or to post it or whatever. It'll be a very large file. So it might be a tricky, but <laughs> All right. good point though. I should probably. Uh, turn the recording off at this point. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.